I just wanted a quieter fire alarm so that I've yeah. never heard in my life. <laughs> and uh, my good uh, friend uh, Ted Neely, with whom uh, thanks go to Ryan and Jody for for uh, for uh, providing this uh, fascinating forum. Uh, I just want to tell Ted that, that it didn't work. He's still sore that at one time in the 1960s, our IndyCott baseball team did beat lacrosse. Uh, it doesn't. Ha it didn't happen very often. They had a legendary. Uh, baseball team and uh, so I, I think he's been sore ever since that one victory so I am thinking he probably pulled that alarm uh, in any event uh, great to see you you know this is like a, it's a bit like a family reunion event here when you gather this uh, group together I look through that list and I see all those names and see uh, faces out there and the reps and the Harwoods and the Teals and Schultices and uh, what, what a great uh, uh, opportunity here to gather the fellowship as well as the information. You can tell by my last name that I'm German, right? Okay, at least half. So I'm mindful of that schedule and I got to really uh, race through this. Uh, uh, on the other hand, my mom's Norwegian. She's 95, so I might just drone on till this afternoon. <laughs> but not really. We'll get through this uh, here pretty quick for you. Thanks for coming and for your interest. Uh, a lot of you know about land races, and my uh, uh, work with, uh, with the team has been about rediscovering our ancestral past and relating that then to relevance for the 21st century. Um, land races, th th there were tens of thousands of land race grains and land race crops of all kinds throughout the world. Every little valley had something uh, a, a cereal, a, a vegetable that had adapted to local conditions over many, many thousands of years. Uh, and so there was vast diversity, and as you know, certainly in the world of grains and wheats in particular, uh, you have the capacity for vast genetic diversity because it is the most complex biological organism on the planet. Uh, it's always a little humbling, as you know, 60,000 or so genes in a uh, in a, in a wheat cell. Uh, those of us that are human beings have about half that many. So uh, complex and leads to a vast uh, number of, uh, of arrangements and, and sources and adaptabilities. This was known to people um, for, for hundreds of years. Uh, here's a line from Thomas Tusser's uh, famous 16th century uh, work related to the good husbandry, and he's all, he, they're already talking about the distinguishing elements of uh, land race grain varieties. Rivet red or white, pol polar grains, uh, herky and perky and all the rest. They knew there were many, many different, and by the way, he's just talking about the diversity in central and southern England, which uh, gave rise, incidentally, to many of the grains that we uh, originally raised here in the Pacific Northwest. Um, you can't see it in this photo, but this is really a fascinating image. This is, uh, by the way, there were no uh, small cereal grains native to North America. Um, and uh, so, of course, you had corn, maize in, uh, in the Midwest and others. But here in the Northwest, uh, until the dawn of the 19th century, th th there were no oats, there were no barleys, there were no wheats, nothing like that. Um, but there was a very forward-thinking leader of what is, by the way, today the oldest uh, incorporated enterprise in the Western Hemisphere, the Hudson's Bay Company, founded in the 17th century. And oh, those of you that take a trip occasionally to Victoria or Vancouver, you still see the Bay Store, and they have a little division there uh, related to their, uh, their uh, past. The Hudson's Bay Company got started here in the 1820s, and uh, uh, they were visited in 1825 by the governor of the country, Sir George Simpson, the governor of the company. And uh, he came out basically with a message uh, to the fur traders in the Northwest uh, telling them, uh, we're getting tired of sending food to you guys. Uh, thanks for the furs, but that's a long way to mail a hamburger. Uh, you guys got to start taking care of yourself. And so in 1825, he makes the first of two circumnavigations. He visits the fur trading posts in the Northwest and 
What a delight to uh, have Bob Quinn here. Bob's over out of the Fort Benton part of the country, and I was sharing a little earlier with him. My, my great-grandfather, Andrew Sunwald, for whom my, my nephew, Andrew, who is here today, is named for, was a woodcutter at Fort Benton. And uh, it, among with these other fur trading posts, uh, were transformed into the first agricultural centers in the Pacific Northwest because of the foresight of people like Sir George Simpson. So guess what's in that boat? We can't see it, but well, first of all, hey, guess who's Sir George, right? Can you imagine wearing a hat like that out here in 1825? He was pretty easy to spot. He's got a keg of grain with him, and that was the very first grain that ever came to the Pacific Northwest. It actually got the nickname Hudson's Bay Wheat. Uh, we did quite a bit of detective work, thanks to our good friends here at uh, the WSU Research Center, and, and eventually we were able to track down uh, the, that, that very specific variety. Uh, a lot of you, you, I can see in the program too, associated with the USDA, and uh, fortunately, about 1910, <laughs> Uh, by the way, what a job description, right? Plant explorer. That's what these guys were. In 1910, one of them was out here fishing around in the northwest, went to the Willamette Valley. He found one person still growing Hudson's Bay wheat, and had he not kept that, this line would have been lost forever. Uh, so we did track it down, and uh, we've been raising it. It's actually English white llamas. And uh, here you can see the scope of the uh, fur trading posts. And then from these centers, all across western Montana to western Washington, Fort Nisqually, Fort Vancouver was the grand emporium uh, where the, essentially the capital of the fur traders at that time. And then that began the story of grain culture all throughout the Northwest. Within a century, we have people like William Spillman, who's a familiar name to most of you here. We're just a few miles from Spillman Farm. Spillman realized the opportunities too, not just with the original land races, but uh, with hybridizing. And we, and we sort of just take this for granted today. Actually, hybridizing was essentially invented here at Washington State then College. Uh, you all know the story from our old elementary days of Gregor Mendel and figuring out how, uh, uh, how, how genetics worked in a, in a kind of theoretical way. But Mendel was working with uh, peat garden peas, which are far more simplified in terms of their genetic makeup. And by the way, the only time he published his work was in an obscure Austrian journal that maybe five people, uh, you know, read, you know, about the number of the... Uh, <coughs> purchase some of the books that I, I, I write at that level. Uh, but he, uh, he nevertheless did important work, although it was virtually unknown. Spillman independently rediscovered the laws of heredity here. And because he was also a brilliant mathematician, was able to come up with the rules that uh, relate really today to, uh, to the development then of modern grains. But Spillman never lost his love of the land races. And in fact, he told an audience in Portland that I can hybridize for any particular qualities you want, but I'm not sure I can ever improve on the healthy nutritional quality of what was originally the design of the creator. He almost waxed uh, spiritual about this. So I love this line from Zane Gray. And, uh, and, and by the way, Zane Gray spent the, I know I'm going off script here, but Zane Gray was the most, his, his books in the early 1900s were only outsold in the United States by the Bible. Uh, he, was, he had a best-selling list uh, every year from 1915 into the 30s. After he died, to tell you the truth, his books were still bestsellers. And he spent the summer of 1917 here in eastern Washington and wrote this best-selling book, The uh, Desert of Wheat. And we have found out now where he lived. We've got a big exhibit of that down at past with the Franklin County Museum. Hope you come down someday. But he's talking here uh, of, about this incredible association of the earliest grains to making meaning in life and the beauty of the Northwest. When we talk about restorative agriculture and the work that we're doing on our 
small farm between the communities of Colfax and, or excuse me, Endicott and, and St. John uh, down on the Palouse River. Um, we talk about working holistically with the natural world. We want to promote education as well as economic development, personal associations with a lifestyle. Uh, in addition to that, we seek to create healthy soil conditions uh, for our crops. We seek to document the diversity of natural flora and fauna in the region. And uh, the relevance of this to our day and age is increasingly known through the work of USDA and other researchers that we see higher mineral levels. I'll show you a chart which uh, uh, will indicate this in a bit more specificity. Fuller brand layer for digestive uh, values. Uh, genetic variation, many of you might know the uh, diseases with the, um, with the uh, uh, horrific rusts that uh, afflicted uh, Africa several years ago were defeated because of hybridization with land races that had resistance to those diseases. Uh, finally, and this is one of the most exciting things to me, are the distinct culinary attributes. Uh, you know, I mean, this is, this is just uh, uh, almost a, a part of our lingua franca popularly without really knowing the specifics. We talk about French crepes but it's made with every kind of grain apart from whatever came from France. How about French grapes really made with yellow Breton flour that made French grapes? We're, we're, we're interested in that. How about all those wonderful uh, uh, baked goods that you see with Hispanic bakeries here in the Inland Northwest that actually come from Sonora grain, which is what it was made for? How about English pancakes that actually come from white lava wheat? Um, which uh, which we're seeing is catching on more in the, the east. Tracy and I were just talking a little about that. But here in the northwest, people are becoming increasingly interested in those things. Ecotourism. I haven't got a dollar in my pocket yet from ecotourism, but there's scarcely a week that goes by that we don't get an inquiry from somebody from Florida to Kansas to California about wanting to come out and, and see our farm and learn a little about land races and these heritage stories. I tell them, well, come at your own risk. There's mud all over the place, and yeah, we got weeds out there because we're on the Palouse River, and that barn's 120 years old, and I still haven't fixed the roof. But yeah, a lot of interest in these things. And so the potential is there to make many of these things happen. How about Scottish oatmeal with real Scottish oats? How about, uh, you know, the nature of uh, the oat trials that we've had uh, at the White House was a, a project we were working with kids to try to promote understandings for education, for nutrition. Turkey red wheat was the wheat that transformed the American milling industry. Uh, did, did you know before the 1870s, there was no true loaf of bread in America? I know that sounds odd because yes, Martha Washington was making bread for George and all the rest. But you know, if you would have seen that, it was about as dense as a brick. It was all soft white. There were no hard red bread wheats in America before the 1870s. Uh, the, the reason is because those grains are native to South Russia and the Crimean Peninsula. And so when the, uh, the Germans from that area migrated here, because Americans aren't best known always for getting A's in geography, we called it turkey wheat. It's actually red Crimean. And that became the go-to bread grain that uh, transformed the American milling industry. By the way, it was so hard, the millers didn't like it right off the bat. It was hard on their equipment. But then they kept saying, just taste this stuff. And today, virtually all bread wheats in America, if you trace back the genealogy, you'll come to turkey red. We've been experimenting with French tuzella uh, for a crepe flour and others like that. And uh, have uh, Amy Halloran, who's probably, we call her America's pancake queen. Uh, she was out a couple of years ago and uh, made pancakes with this flour and, and uh, we had a great time. Um, here's one I'm most excited about. <clears throat> if I told you we had grain from the Garden of Eden, you'd probably all roll your eyes. And I have to tell you, I think the man from the USDA who discovered this in Mesopotamia 120 years ago probably rolled his, eye too, his eyes too, like, oh yeah, great story. Uh, they got back to the 
um, uh, USD uh, Grain Center in uh, Bellsville, Maryland, put it under the lab, did some tests on it, and uh, the report comes back. It's a hard white land race. Now, most of you know virtually all grains are in our major categories of soft white, hard white, uh, you, know, you know the drill. It, it, it is extremely rare in nature where you have a hard white. Of course, today we hybridize for it and you're paid a premium. Uh, you can have a light colored bread. Americans, right? We like our bread light, we like our beer clear. And you go to Europe and you know breads are brown and the beer is cloudy. It, it's actually better for you. And, uh, and so uh, it, this is a long story on how we found this uh, grain that I, I don't have time to go into, but, but it's, uh, it's, it's wonderful and we've, uh, we've been growing it out now for, for three years. It takes a long time. This slide defies every rule of PowerPoint, so I apologize to you. Uh, but I put it up there because in red, <clears throat> these are the highest nutritional values of various wheat types. Uh, all of us in the Northwest are proud of production, uh, but sometimes, uh, you know, there are limits to production in terms of the inverse relationship with density of nutrition. Those red values are the highest nutritional levels of these various classes of grains. And look, that land races, primitive grains, are the highest across the board, across the board. So, lots of implications, interesting opportunities for artists and bakers, for craft brewers. We can all do something to, uh, to support the work and make it happen, and your presence here is certainly encouraging. Uh, here's some things I've recently written and have enjoyed getting the story down, but it's all because of experts like you making it happening. Uh, making it happen, listening to your stories, and I'm deeply grateful for uh, the kinds of expertise that, that you bring to this. You, your parents, your grandparents, and uh, hopefully we can take these to, to new, new realms that, that really enhance the agricultural productivity of all these beautiful places we call home. Thanks so much, and uh, joy to be with you. Uh, we're going to be close to the, and by the way, this is my latest uh, project here. Uh, I know I'm close to going over time, but uh, I just got so fascinated by the nature of uh, fine art and literature associated with the Pacific Northwest and wider world. And uh, so I just finished, uh, it's actually the largest manuscript I've ever written, 300,000 words. So if any of you have insomnia, I'll be happy to pass it on to you. Uh, and uh, this, this, is a, this is the actual size, it's actually a small version of this painting. It hangs in the Russian Museum in uh, St. Petersburg. Um, it's, it's, the real thing is life size, and this, this, this picture tells the story, doesn't it, of a family working in the field. Um, and by the way, yes, that is a thistle in there, so my father would uh, not be too upset with me because those things do happen. But it's fascinating to me that we have people in more recent times like Zane Gray or going way back to folks hundreds of years ago depicting such, uh, such grand views of things that you and I often take for granted. Well, uh, about one minute here, so if anybody has a question, I, I'd be happy to respond. You've been a great, uh, great audience. Thanks for your interest. And anybody have a question, and uh, I'll uh, pack it into one minute. <coughs> Okay, I'll make my minute. Well, thank Thanks, you. Jody. Well, thank you.